Hey ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. As always, it is Nick here, back to your daily crypto news and analysis. And today we are going to be talking about Ripple and XRP as well as the vast majority of crypto and finance. And let's dive in to some of the statements that Brad Garlinghouse made on stage at Mainnet. Uh, this is of course with Stuart Alrodi right next to him. And of course, we do see him taking shots at the SEC. Wouldn't have it any other way. And when you see Ripple's Brad Garlinghouse comes out swinging everything the SEC cares about, they lost. A freight train was driven through Gensler's arguments that these are all securities. And listen, as we sit here and as we do wait, right, we are waiting for the big day to emerge where we actually have regulations around crypto. And I do think that's getting there, right? Every single day that goes by, we are getting closer and closer. Um, a lot of people believe that there's already regulations there. They are just waiting for them to fully go live once all the traditional players are set up. They have their you know systems to go. Um, we don't know, right? We could speculate all day on that. But one thing to me that is sure is that they are gearing up. They are getting ready. And I think that the the losses around the SEC that have been piling up recently are taking a lot of weight um off of the sec's name and what they really kind of bring to the space because i think everyone now looks at them as pretty much a clown show right and for the longest time i think that a lot of people were kind of concerned about what the sec was doing at least back in 2021 but from there to now i think everyone's pretty comfortable right now and i think that what we are seeing from you know brad and St and stewart adorati himself i think is is confirmation of that right like they are confident um in what they have accomplished through the sec lawsuit i think that they are very confident around you know hiring a ton of individuals as well and acquiring a lot of these companies like ripple is going all in at this point but also we do see here when you walk into the sec building they're not your friend and it's not a church you don't have to bow down again just more confirmation that you know they are very confident they are very confident now. And a lot of people have been speculating on if this is building for a major settlement or not. Don't know about that. Um, I don't really care too much about the settlement. I think that we already kind of know what we needed to know around XRP. But again, a settlement would be huge. Don't know if that's going to be the case. But, you know, they are very talkative at this point. But also, we've seen this as well. Shout out to Ingrid for the video. Mainnet 2023 Blockchain Association CEO K. Smith interviewed about Coinbase and Ripple cases at the event. Ripple scored a major win. We hope to get additional clarity. And check this out. What's your thought on the recent SEC court um, losses? I mean, you'll be start talking about this on the main stage today. And what yeah. are your thoughts on the Coinbase case? Yeah, no, I'm really excited. I'm going to be sitting down uh, here at Mainnet today with Paul Grewal, who is the chief legal officer of Coinbase. But, you know, it's very interesting because as Congress is working through this legislative gap, uh, or this, filling the legislative gap, we've seen regulatory agencies try to test the limits of the law by using a regulation by enforcement approach. And so they're doing these cases. And what we've seen is, particularly over the summer, Ripple, whose booth is right behind us here, they scored a major win in that XRP is not deemed to be a security. And so we're finding that we're not able to get clarity with the regulatory agencies but we are able to get some clarity through the courts. And so we're hoping that as the Coinbase case moves through, we'll continue to get additional clarity, which will allow time for Congress to figure out the appropriate framework and get that enacted into law. So yeah, I mean, we are getting clarity through the courts, but we hope to not have to go to court um, in order to get that clarity. And I just recently made a video talking about a lot of the political problems with crypto as well. and. You know why this this is not an easy fight because there's a lot of corruption at hand especially around a lot of these you know major lawsuits and cases happening around crypto uh we hope for a day very soon where we don't need to worry about that anymore and we actually do have clarity for the space and um you know proper regulations also shout out to crypto eddie uh it seems as though a lot of the companies that were tied to ripple are expanding their services and becoming major key players so we do see asia banking changing fast 2019 union bank ph and ripple partner to power a wallet with xrp on demand liquidity 2022 union bank went live on medico for crypto services today they became the first universal bank to secure a license to operate as a virtual asset service provider so 
this is why it's so big to focus on a lot of the partnerships uh, with Ripple, right? Because, you know, even though initially you you have things happening around like on-demand liquidity, they also expand beyond that as well. Um, it's a domino effect. Uh, a lot of the players that are tied to Ripple that aren't utilizing XRP right now, in my opinion, will soon utilize XRP powered on demand liquidity. Why? It makes sense. Um, I've addressed this as well. And it's it's truly that domino effect of, you know, if they do partner with one player and they have, you know, 100 plus um, players on their network, well, guess what? Now Ripple just tapped into all of the, the clients that are utilizing that service as well. Like, that's why I focus on the partnerships. And this is a great one to look at um, as they do expand their services and, you know, even beyond Ripple with Medico, which we do know Ripple did acquire. It's great to see. And um, also, we do see a video getting posted by Riz XRP. I'm pretty sure that this is a, a dated video, but it's still a great video because it is gold. We do see fixed supply, increase in demand. You don't have to go to MIT to know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> just had to get that in there anyway the, the point i'm making is simply that there is you know there is relatively speaking leaving forks aside there's relatively speaking fixed supply and you have increasing demand and when endowments and institutions you know joey and i sat in a meeting not that long ago with you know some of the, the largest institutional money in the world trying to get smart about crypto they owned zero on that day i don't know if they do today but as they enter the market, you have fixed supply, increasing demand. You don't have to go to MIT to know what's going to happen. <laughs> I, I did not go to MIT, just for the record. But. but yeah, I mean, as we really kind of look at this, the demand around digital assets right now is growing, whether it be XRP or not, it is growing. But we do see over here as well from 801 underscore XRP, Zumo Pay Digital Assets 2023. Zumo is a B2B digital assets infrastructure and Ripple Sandy Young contributed to this report on Chapter 5 invoicing and business partners or payments. Sorry, more contributors list and a link below. And we do see some of the images from this thread and we do see invoicing and business payments. We do see a quote from Sandy Young talking a little bit about using blockchain as a bridge to move money across borders to enable cheaper and reliable and on demand uh, transactions as well. Uh, very interesting quote there. We also do see a few uh, things around digital assets, CBDC, stable coins, cryptocurrencies, things like that. Also over here, we do see the industry use case. Again, really kind of just showing us um, a, a, a full use case of Zumo. Um, this is really kind of just talking a little bit about the overall path of it as well, embedded blockchain. And then over here, we do see considerations, ecosystem interactions, reading between the lines as well. Um, there's not too much there to really kind of look at, but I do want to ta talk about uh, some of these um, images down here, specifically this one. Um, but I just want to show you guys some of the names here. Like for an example, even State Street was there. Um, but here we have the quote from Cindy Young herself. It's clear that innovations with digital assets uh, or digital payment assets are continuing to grow and blockchain based payment models are increasingly interacting with the broader financial system to solve real world problems. We're seeing more businesses using blockchain as a bridge to move money across borders to enable cheaper, more reliable and on-demand transactions. For corporate treasurers, for instance, we are managing substantial pools of liquidity across multiple markets. The visibility and control that these payment rails provide is crucial. Digital assets like CBDC, stablecoins and cryptocurrencies play a significant role in transforming the payment system with their ability to increase the speed and efficiency of payments and reduce costs. There is a growing appetite to roll out these projects. The Bank of England and HMT are considering plans for a digital pound, while other jurisdictions like the Republic of Palau and Colombia Central Bank are piloting use cases leveraging Ripple CBDC platform to drive innovation and open up new opportunities for exchanging value. Anticipation for tokenized real world assets is also growing, and we are already seeing this interact with CBDC infrastructure. For example, as part of its EHKD pilot program, Hong Kong Monetary Authority has chosen Ripple and its partners, including Fubon Bank, to showcase a real estate tokenization use case. And uh, we also do see at the bottom, financial institutions and central banks are pursuing real world initiatives, changing the status quo with existing payment rails and helping increase financial inclusion. The desire for transformation needs to be balanced with the need to maintain stability on a global scale. Ultimately, success will depend upon adoption and education as well as global regulations. Very interesting. And also, over here, we do see Ripple's blockchain network is more or is now more than 100 strong. Again, what I am trying to get at here is when we do have a fixed supply with the increase in demand, 
we already know what's going to happen. Value is going to surge. When we look at this, right, we know in 2017, they had over 100 financial institutions. All right, fast forward to November 6, 2019. So two years later, they seen 300 customers on the network. I do wonder how many customers they have now. We haven't really seen this updated in a while, um, but I'm sure that it's probably a lot more, right? Like we continue to see Ripple expand their network. And when we look at that, right, like we know on-demand liquidity has seen major growth. As more and more demand is there around on-demand liquidity, well, when you have a fixed supply, whether it be 50 billion or even 100 billion, you're going to see the value change. And also over here you have shaping the future of cross-border payments. This is a one pager. But if we scroll down, right? They even said that in 2023 already adopted in 70 countries, it is estimated that 87% of global financial transactions will be supported by ISO 2022 by 2023. With RippleNet, you achieve a lot more efficiencies than utilizing traditional world entities. And it's all because of DLT. And remember that Ripple was the first member focused on DLT on the standards body. And when we look beyond this, and we actually look at the customer case studies, we know that a lot of the customers, in fact, almost all of the customers have achieved incredible efficiencies because of the technology behind Ripple. And these are very, very large players. Now, also over here, we do see from 801 underscore XRP, the CEO of uh, Bank of America was at CBOS 2023. Check out this quick video. And I want to expand upon this real quick. And then I'm going to, going to wrap up the video. Listen closely. Let's talk about uh, collaboration, because here at Cybos, there's going to be a lot of opportunity, hopefully, for collaboration. Can you talk about how financial institutions are working together to make that payment system better? Yeah, and so I think you, you heard some of the dialogue uh, earlier, but I think in the end of the day, with all the stuff that's going on out there, the cybersecurity uh, question that was raised earlier, the need for frictionless payments, the need for speed, the need to connect uh, uh, payment systems that weren't necessarily connected. You know, these are the things that we need to do and collaboration, collaboration among participants allows us to let that happen. And, it, you know, when we think about whether it's real time in the U.S. and development of that, whether it's, you know, the need to, um, you know, to send the messaging and, and the IS, oh, 20, 0, 20, 20 whatever it is. Uh, it, <laughs> I you know, to need one. to get that all right and stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know, these are just things. No, no company, even if you could do it on your own, it's worthless to do it on your own because then you're standing outstanding by yourself. And so if you think about something as simple as, uh, you know, Visa. Visa was a Bank of America credit card called Bank of America credit card originally. And it was given to the industry to democratize it through the industry to make it effective. It was never going to be effective as a single per bank's uh, uh, thing. And so these collaborations are critically important. And the ability to, to learn from each other, the ability to en enhance each other's understanding, the ability to connect the diverse economies, the you know, 200 or so countries in the world, and, and make sure the payment system works for you know, all different profiles of companies, uh, the largest and most sophisticated and the most rural and small in, in developing economies, all that is critically important. And if you don't have organizations like a SWIFT, it just isn't going to happen. And, and that's where, you know, the collaboration is so critical. And what's encouraging when 8,000 people plus show up in uh, Toronto, Canada for a week to exchange ideas and information and, and learn from each other, you know, that shows our industry is actually trying to tackle this basic question, which is how do we make the world's economies function better and function, frankly, it's also UN General Assembly Week, function along the sustainable development goals, providing uh, uh, development growth that is fair to all societies. Therefore, it will go on with much more vigor. And I think that's a great place to leave it. I'm sure many here will be contemplating that and having those conversations here at Cybos. Ryan Monahan, the CEO of Bank of America, thanks so much for your time. So yeah, I mean, when we really kind of look at what he said there, to really kind of analyze what he is addressing, he's saying like, the space is evolving, right? And 
when we look at that, it's going to be through collaboration. But outside of that, I think that when we look at these walled gardens that are launching, City, JP Morgan, all of them, the issue is, is that no other bank is going to utilize another bank's token. And that's where this video comes into clutch, right? What he's talking about is a decentralized currency being the ruler of all of them. Listen closely to this. Digital movement of money. One half of the money moved by consumers today at Bank of America, today, is moved digitally. One half. This is not something new. When you get to an anonymous currency, that's a different question. And that's a policy question of whether we want an anonymous currency out there of size and scale and scope. And that's what the, you start to see people struggle. Do you then, think we do? Do you think we I, want I, it? I, I don't think you want it. I think the reason why the $100 bill is the largest denomination of bills was to make money more difficult to move other than through a verifiable system. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a lesson a lot of economies have learned over time as they brought their denominations down to improve the transparency mm -hmm. of the economy, mm -hmm. the ability to track it, the ability to find the money, the ability to have it come through in that huge AML and KYC work we do and the industry does. And it helps you f find all kinds of interesting things and, and that's important for law enforcement and other types of things. So I think that that's not the speculation. I'll let other people reflect on it. And you're seeing great debates on it. But I think you know, the idea of digitizing money is not new. The wire system is a digital transfer system, the ACH system. The question is, what's exciting is when you can walk around Bryant Park out here and go in these little shops that are set up for Christmas and be able to tap your phone or something like that as opposed to being carrying dollars. Those are exciting things. To get that last mile electronified, that's what to have you and I exchange money if we had lunch together through Zell. That's that's exciting. That takes the cash because in the end of the day of the fifty-three billion dollars expenses on round numbers we'll have next year, five of it will be to move coin, currency, and checks around the system. Hmm. And if I can take that down in a safe, verifiable ability to do it, know your customer in AML, take that down. That's a very valuable thing for us. And then you just ripple that through the industry. And we we used to quote that we could ask them to destroy every we could we could pay them to reprint the money rather than have to cycle it back in and out because it was cheaper to move it around now some of our contracting parties that move it around for us might not be happy with that but that's <laughs> the way it is so yeah when you know he's talking here he's kind of giving us a, a, a few hints but at the end of the day we know right like we know that bank of america had set its sights already on ripple in fact, we know that they just recently praised Ripple for the impact on cross-border payments. Uh, we know that Ripple said that, or uh, Bank of America said that they would love to utilize XRP once all of the uncertainty is out of the question. I still think that they're kind of waiting for uh, Ripple themselves to get uh, the win in the lawsuit outside of XRP. Um, but everything that we see, everything that we see going on in this industry, specifically around payments and how, how can we move money the fastest? It really kind of goes back to the decentralization aspect. And it's not going to be Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin has failed in its overall agenda. Um, the whole idea of like anonymous money is ridiculous. It's not going to be massively adopted. It's not going to be massively accepted. Um, KYC is going to have to be there. Things are going to have to be in place. But at the end of the day, like XRP is one of the best opportunities in the space um, around, you know, connecting the world and ultimately bridging money and moving money and settling money in the fastest way possible. This is why I say like, you know, we are at a very interesting moment in time where these major entities want to jump in, jump in on the space and harness the power behind a lot of these tokens and uh, these payment systems. And I think that what Ripple has created with RippleNet is very exciting because it embraces what XRP is and um, utilizes it in a way that can ultimately disrupt and change the game entirely. So with that being said, I hope that you guys enjoy this video. If you guys did, definitely leave a like, subscribe to notifications on if you guys more free content. If you guys are welcome to follow me on Twitter and join the free Discord in the description below. And with that being said, guys, this has been Nick. Peace out.